Lens is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson, we're going to talk about thin lenses specifically, and we're going to find out that everything we learned about mirrors is going to be fairly analogous when we apply it to thin lenses. So the mirror equation is also called the thin lens equation and applies just as well. So 1 over p plus 1 over q equals 1 over f. Magnification is defined in exactly the same way. We're still going to talk about the focal distance. We'll talk about real versus virtual images and inverted versus upright images. Everything will be fairly analogous uh, with one key difference. So light's going to be refracted instead of reflected. We'll apply this to briefly to combinations of lenses as well, as well as to the human eye. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, if you haven't watched the last lesson on mirrors, I highly recommend you watch that one first because I'm going to be alluding back to it uh, continuously. We're not going to lay all the groundwork we laid in the last lesson in this lesson because most of it is exactly the same. So we will define the focal distance, and the focal distance, just like with mirrors, is half the radius of curvature. So the mirror equation is also called the thin lens equation, 1 over p plus 1 over q equals 1 over f, where p is the object distance from the middle of the lens, q is the image distance from the middle of the lens, and f is still the focal distance. Magnification is still defined in exactly the same way, height of the image relative to the height of the object, or negative q over p as well. We will get a couple new things here, and we'll come back to this in a little while, So, but everything's going to be analogous. Now, instead of having concave and convex mirrors, we're going to have converging and diverging lenses. So it turns out a converging lens is going to be analogous to a concave mirror, and sometimes concave mirrors are called converging mirrors. So, And then the diverging lens is going to be analogous to the convex mirror, and sometimes convex mirrors are called diverging mirrors. Now the reason they're called converging and diverging lenses deals with you know the, what light is likely to do when it is refracted and passing through these lenses. Now the diverging one is a better name, so because we're going to find out that the light rays will always diverge. They're never going to converge onto a single point. They're never going to intersect uh, in actuality, and so you're never going to form a real image. You're always just going to form a virtual image, just like we saw with convex mirrors. Now, in converging lenses, that's going to be an analogous situation to what we saw with concave mirrors, which again are sometimes called converging mirrors, is that you have a chance that the light rays are going to converge. So if your object distance is bigger than the focal length, i.e. if the object is placed further away from the lens than the focal distance, then you will get a real image. The light rays, after they're refracted, after passing through the lens, will really intersect and form a real image. And that's why it's called a converging lens. Now, we gotta be careful though, because they're not always going to converge. If you place your object closer to the lens than the focal distance, so where P is less than F, just like we saw with concave mirrors, in that case, the light rays won't really converge to a single point. They won't really intersect. You'll get a virtual image instead of a real image. So the light rays will actually diverge instead of converge and stuff. So not, not perfect in how we, you know, the convention which we named these lenses. So, but the converging lens, again, analogous to a concave mirror and the diverging lens analogous to a convex mirror. Okay, so let's start by drawing some light ray diagrams the same way we did with mirrors. And in this case, the big key difference again is that light is going to be passing through the lens. It's not going to be reflected. Uh, at least we're not going to be keeping track of the little tiny bit that is reflected. So we're going to be looking at just the part that passes through the lens and is refracted instead. But you got to be able to draw the same kind of light ray diagrams that you did for the mirrors. So, and, and fortunately for us, it's fairly analogous for the most part. All right, so we'll start with this one here, where the object distance is beyond the focal distance. And the first light wave ray we're going to draw is going to be parallel to the principal axis. Now, it turns out I'm going to ignore the, kind of the refraction that's going on inside the lens. And we're going to kind of have it just going from the middle of the lens and stuff like that. But it's actually happening at the boundaries and things of this sort. All right, so light comes in parallel to the principal axis and then is refracted through the focal point. So fairly similar to what we saw with a concave mirror. Next one, we're going to have the light traveling through the focal point. 
So, and then being refracted parallel to the principal axis. And we can see where those light rays are really converging and where that real image is forming. And then finally, third light ray is gonna go straight to the center of the lens here, right at the principal axis, and just keep passing right on through. So, and all these light rays converge on this point right here because they are really converging. This is a real image in this case. All right, so analogous to what we saw when the object was placed further than the focal distance with a concave mirror. So you'll notice this is a real image, and just like we saw before with any single lens, just like with any single mirror, a real image is going to be inverted. And we can see that with the light ray diagram as well, with the fact that our object here was above the principal axis, but our mirror is being, uh, I shouldn't say reflected, but being refracted below the principal axis. And so it's gonna be upside down and inverted instead. So real images are still inverted for any single lens. We'll see, we might have to revise that a little bit when we deal with combinations of lenses toward the end of this lesson. Okay, next example here, we've got the, an object here, but now it's placed within the focal distance, but we draw the same ray. So the first one we're gonna draw again is, comes in parallel to the principal axis, and then gets refracted through the focal point. Next one's gonna go through the focal point. Well, we're already closer than the focal point, so we're gonna kinda go through as if we were coming from that focal point. So, and then that one's gonna come out parallel to the principal axis. And then finally, we'll have another one, another one going right through the center. And that was not a great drawing. Right through the center. And we can see that these rays are not intersecting at all. So they are diverging instead. So there's no real image formed. But if we kind of extrapolate back, they look like they converge, or at least they originated, I should say, from a common point. Do they really know? They're, they really don't. There never really was light up at this point or anything like that. It only appears that they do, and that's therefore a virtual image in this case. So and keep in mind here, virtual images are still upright for any single lens, just like they were with any single mirror. And we can see that here because in this case, the object's above the principal axis and the virtual image is also above the principal axis, therefore leading us to conclude that it's going to be upright. And finally, we'll take a look at the diverging lens here, which again is analogous to our convex mirror. So, and the light rays are similar, but there is one key thing you will need to remember. So, but the first one will be exactly analogous. We're gonna draw the first light ray parallel to the principal axis. So, and in this case though, it's gonna uh, diverge instead of converge and look like it had come from this near focal point right here, just as if we'd drawn a straight line there. So that's the first one. The next one, we're gonna head for the focal point, but you gotta remember this, you're heading for the far focal point now instead. So we're gonna head for that far focal point. Didn't quite get there. And then this one gets refracted parallel to the principal axis. And then finally, the last one is gonna pass straight through the center and just keep going. All right, so what we can see here is that our three refracted rays are never going to intersect. They are diverging and hence uh, appropriate name here for a diverging lens. And it doesn't matter where the object is placed. Again, it could be closer than the focal point, further than the focal point, it does not matter. The light rays are always going to diverge. Now, if we kind of go backwards though, we can kind of see that they all appear as if they came from a common point right there. So in this case, did they really come from that common point? So no, they just appear to have originated from that common point. And therefore, that is a virtual image. So, and in this case, uh, we can see that this is definitely smaller. The image is gonna be significantly smaller than the object, just like we saw with the convex mirror. So the image is always smaller than the object is uh, in the convex mirror as well. So the other thing we can see is that both the object and the image are above the principal axis, and so it's going to be an upright image. So just as we've seen before, virtual images are upright. They go hand in hand any single lens that's gonna be true. And from here, we're ready to do some plugging and chugging. And we're gonna essentially do the exact, two of the exact same questions we covered in the last lesson, just now seeing that they apply exactly to lenses as well. Before we get into the plugging and chugging, just a reminder of some things. So 
one for any single lens, P is going to be positive. We'll see with combinations of lenses that that may not always be true. So, but for one single lens, just like with one mirror, it's gonna be positive. Now, Q could be positive or negative. For a real image, Q is positive. For a virtual image, Q is negative. And then finally, F. So the focal distance for a converging lens is positive. For a diverging lens, just like with a convex mirror, F is going to be negative. All right, uh, we'll start from there. So the first question here should look pretty familiar, but an object, uh, let me start that over. An object is placed 12 centimeters in front of a converging lens where F equals 4.0 centimeters. Where is the image located? Is it real or virtual, upright or inverted? What is the magnification of the image? It is the exact same numbers as one of the questions we did for a mirror here, in this case for uh, a concave mirror. And so we're just gonna use the thin lens and mirror equation here. So one over P plus one over Q equals one over F. Uh, and in this case, place 12 centimeters in front. So one over 12 centimeters, just like with mirrors. Uh, as long as you use the same units, you can plug P, Q, and F in any unit of length. And I personally like centimeters in this case because I can deal with fractions I can see. One over 0 0.12, not my favorite fraction in the world. All right, one over P plus one over Q, that's gonna be the image distance we wanna solve for, equals one over F, and in this case, F is given as 4.0 centimeters. And being a converging lens here in this case, uh, it is a positive 4.0. And now we can solve for Q here. So one over Q, it's gonna equal one over four minus one over 12. And our lowest common denominator here is going to be 12. And we'll get there by multiplying this first term by three over three. And so we're gonna end up with three over 12 minus one over 12, which is gonna equal two over 12. And so Q is just gonna be the inverse, 12 over two or 6.0 centimeters. Now in this case, we can see at 6.0 centimeters, it is a positive number. That means we have a real image. And for a single lens, if we have real image, that real image is going to be inverted. So we'll get the magnification here in a second. So, but notice we could have predicted this. One, so it's a converging lens. So, but the object distance is placed farther away than the focal point. So when that's true, when the object is placed farther away from the focal point, you're gonna get a real inverted image with our converging lens here. All right, finally, that magnification is gonna equal negative Q over P, which in this case is negative six centimeters over uh, P was 12 centimeters which in this case is gonna equal negative 0.5 for our magnification. And that means in this case, one, that it's inverted. When magnification is negative, you have an inverted image, but now when it's equal to negative 0.5, that means that the image is half the size of the object. The image is smaller than the object. Next question, also one we did in the last lesson uh, on mirrors, uh, at least the same numbers anyways. And it says an object is placed 2.0 centimeters in front of a diverging lens. Focal distance is given as negative 4.0 centimeters. Where's the image located? Is it real or virtual, upright or inverted? And what is the magnification of the image? Well, in this case, we know it's a diverging lens. And so right off the bat, we know it's an upright and virtual image. Qualitatively, good to go. For the calculations, once again, we'll use the thin mirror and uh, thin mirror, thin lens and mirror equation here. So one over P, which in this case is one over 2.0 centimeters plus one over Q we're gonna solve for equals one over F. And again, if they gave us the radius of curvature as 8.0 centimeters, we'd have to remember that focal distance gets plugged in no matter what for a diverging lens as negative. So in this case, negative 4.0 centimeters. And now we can solve for Q here. So in this case, one over Q is gonna equal negative one over four minus one over two. Lowest common denominator here is going to be four. And we'll get there by multipl multiplying that second term by two over two. And so we're gonna end up with negative one over four minus two over four, which is gonna be negative three fourths. And invert that over and Q is gonna equal negative four thirds. And then we can get the magnification as well. Negative Q over P. It's gonna be negative negative four thirds over our P, which was two. And so in this case, it's gonna be negative four over six, or actually negative times a negative, my bad, positive four over six, or positive two thirds. 
The fact that it's positive tells us it's upright, which we already knew, So, but it just confirms that. The fact that it's equal to a number less than one, an absolute value less than one, means it's smaller, the image is smaller than the original object. Cool, but these numbers should match uh, the analogous problems we did in the mirrors lesson as well. Let's take a look at combinations of lenses. So now we're gonna briefly treat combinations of lenses. So, and these problems aren't as bad as they look, but there are a couple key things you need to remember, but ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, use the thin lens equation to figure out where the image is located from the first lens, and then that image is gonna act as the object for the second lens. And so you're really using that thin lens equation in two separate calculations. So it's kind of like twice as long as a typical lens calculation, uh, but it's not really, for the most part, any more challenging. Now, one thing to note about magnification, so when you've got these two lenses, the overall magnification is gonna be just the product of either uh, of the two individual magnifications. So if you spend any time in like a biology lab, you probably played with a little light microscope that had a set eyepiece, often uh, uh, having a magnification of like 4X. So, and then you had three options typically on a rotating objective lens and you might've had like 10X, 30X and 40X. So if you use the 10X, let's say, uh, magnification, it means that your eyepiece is 4X, so your objective was 10X, the overall magnification would have been 40X, 40-fold magnification, something along those lines. So that's kind of how it works, and we're gonna use kind of that setup to do just such a problem. So the, this diagram is included as part of the problem here, and it says, for the given combination of lenses, what would be the image distance for the eyepiece, and what would be the overall magnification? So in this case, we've got an object over here and the light coming off this object is gonna pass through the objective first. So it's gonna form an image and then that image is then gonna be magnified further by the eyepiece and that light passing through is gonna form another image on the other side and where that is located is what we wanna find and then the overall magnification. All right, so the object is three centimeters from the objective and then the distance between the objective and the eyepiece is 18 centimeters. And the first thing I'm gonna do is figure out where does the image formed from the objective uh, where does that image form? And then we use that as the object for the eyepiece as well. All right, so first part of the calculation, we'll use that thin lens equation. So one over P plus one over Q equals one over F. And so in this case, P is just three centimeters. So one over 3.0 centimeters plus one over Q equals, and our objective was two. So one over 2.0 centimeters, and so in this case, one over Q, is gonna equal one over two minus one over three. Lowest common denominator here is going to be six, and we'll get there by multiplying the first term by three over three, and the second term by two over two. And so we're gonna end up with three over six minus one over six, and so in this case, one over Q, three over six minus two over six is one over six, so Q equals 6.0 centimeters. There's the first thing we wanted. Uh, we can also figure out the magnification here, so with just negative Q over P. And so in this case, magnification equals negative Q over P, which in this case uh, is negative six over uh, where we located, P was three, all right? And so that's gonna be negative two. And what that ultimately means is that it's an inverted image uh, and it's twice as big as the original object. Okay, so first half of this is done. And if we look then, so this image is gonna be formed six centimeters in this direction here. So that's where it's gonna form. And if we look then, so how far, so wherever this image is right here, that's gonna be the object for the next lens over. And so we gotta know, well, how far is P for this calculation. Well, if this total distance is 18 and this is six, then this is going to be 12 centimeters. That's gonna be P in the next iteration of this calculation for the eyepiece lens instead. Now, one thing to note, we've stressed that P is always positive for any single lens or mirror, and that's what we kind of emphasized. So this is one of those situations where P could technically end up being negative. Now, in this case, we do want the image to form kind of on this side of this lens here. If for any reason, so these light rays coming off this one actually formed an image on the other side of this lens, we would kind of treat it as a virtual object for the next lens. 
And in, in that case, we'd actually plug in a negative value of P. It's not the norm. It's probably not something you're even going to come across. But if you do, if for any reason, instead of, you know, if, if Q for this first calculation, instead of coming out at six centimeters, let's say it came out at 24 centimeters. Well, then it would have come out on the other side of this lens. And P for the next uh, calculation here would have been negative six centimeters because it would have been six centimeters on the other side of the eyepiece lens. All right, but in this case, P is going to be that 12 centimeters. And we'll do another iteration of this here. So one over 12 centimeters plus one over Q equals one over F. And in this case, F is eight centimeters. And so one over Q is gonna equal one over eight minus one over 12. Lowest common denominator here is going to be 24. We'll get there by multiplying the first term by three over three. Second term by two over two. We'll end up with three over 24 minus two over 24, which is one over 24. So one over Q equals one over 24. So Q equals 24 centimeters. All right, so the image is gonna form way over here, 24 centimeters away. Okay, next part, we need the magnification for the second lens. That way we can then multiply the two magnification, magnifications together to get the overall. Let's just make some room here. All right, so magnification equals negative Q over P, which in this case is negative Q is 24 centimeters. P was 12 centimeters which in this case is going to therefore be negative two. All right, then the overall magnification, which is magnification one times magnification two. Well, the most magnifications ended up being negative two, and so that's gonna be negative two times negative two, which is gonna equal positive four. And so if you notice, both magnifications are negative, which means the first lens, the image gets inverted. And then it gets inverted again. That way the overall magnification ends up being positive and the final image ends up looking upright. Cool, that's how it works for combinations of lenses. Now, one thing to note, we're gonna talk about the eye very briefly here in a second, and we wanted to find one new thing and it's called the lens power. So if you go to get a prescription field uh, for your lenses from your ophthalmologist or optometrist, so they might uh, kind of define your lenses by the lens power. So and regardless of, of what they're trying to correct in you, and we'll talk about when you might need a converging versus diverging lens here in a little bit based on if you have uh, hyperopia or myopia, but regardless of which, so the lens power is defined as one over F as long as you plug F in meters. Now, if it's a converging lens, F is gonna be positive, so the lens power is gonna be positive. But if it's a diverging lens instead, then F is gonna be negative and the lens power is gonna come out negative as well. So. For instance, let's say I told you that F equaled 20 centimeters. Well, then the lens power, 20 centimeters is 0.2 meters. One divided by 0.2 meters would equal five, and five diopters would be the units. So but it's just inverse meters. So the, again, the, the focal distance has to be plugged in in meters, not centimeters. So it would come out in 5D for diopters here for the power. And the fact that the focal distance is given as positive told us it was a converging lens. So if on the other hand, we'd given F equals negative 10 centimeters, right off the bat, well, that's a diverging lens. So when you do one over F, well, 10 centimeters is 0.1 meters. And one divided by 0.1, now the power would equal negative 10 instead. Cool, and that's all I really wanna say about lens power. Big key is just remembering that the, the focal length has to get plugged in in meters. So now we're briefly gonna take a look at the human eye and see how we have a, a system of lenses that is used to focus light on the retina on the back of the eye, which we then uh, you know, shuttle off impulses through the optic nerve to the brain and interpret it as vision and see kind of how it works. Now, in this case, it's a very simplistic diagram of the eye. I'm not actually gonna draw a separate cornea and a separate lens. I'm just gonna kind of view them. They really are a combination, but uh, it's kind of one lens at kind of the front of the eye, and their job is to focus light onto the retina back here. Now, it's actually rather complex. It turns out most of the refraction happens at the cornea, and then the light just passes through the lens, but that lens uh, is malleable. So 
There are some muscles on it that can squeeze it and tug on it and stuff like that and change its focal distance. That way you can focus on things that are near and things that are far. So, and you do it without thinking. Your brain controls it involuntarily, if you will. All right, but what's supposed to ultimately happen is light rays are gonna come in and then get refracted and converge on a point here. And they're supposed to converge and form an image right on the retina itself. So and when it forms right on that retina, you get a clear image that you can see. Now there's a couple different problems we might have. So one is what if these light rays don't converge enough and they would form an image if they could all the way back here instead. So instead we'd find them kind of refracting light to form an image back here, but they never reach back there because we hit the back of the eye first. And so at the retina, we would not form a clear image whatsoever. So, and this would be an indication of what we call farsightedness or hyperopia. And so this person's gonna have a problem seeing things close up. Things that are far away, not so problem. But what we're gonna find out is that their near point is uh, a little bit longer than most people's near point. So your near point is the nearest thing you can kind of discern and your far point, the farthest thing. So their near point is gonna be a little on the large side. So things that are really close up, they're not gonna see them really well because their uh, combination of their cornea lens is not going to be able to make the light converge and form an image on the retina. Cool, so if we wanted to correct this problem, so think about this, do we need these light rays that wanna form an image back here? Do we need them to converge or diverge in order to form an image on the retina? Well, in this case, the problem is that they're not converging soon enough, we need them to converge more than they are. And so what we wanna do in that case is out here, we'd wanna put another converging lens, so, that would cause these light rays to converge just a little bit before they ever reach the combination of the cornea and the lens. And that way now, so because they got a little head start, now they can converge and form an image on the retina. So the other problem obviously is if these light rays in this case form an image in front of the retina instead. So and if they form an image in front of the retina, so that's myopia or nearsightedness. And so these people typically don't have a problem seeing things near, their near point's not the issue, it's their far point. For a typical uh, healthy adult who's not too old, your far point might be all the way at infinite distance. So, but for a person who's got myopia, it's gonna be much, much shorter than that. And so again, they can see things close up, they have a little more problem with things at a distance. And so now all of a sudden, if we give them this converging lens again, uh, that's not gonna help. It's gonna make things worse because now it's gonna make the rays want to converge even more so and you'd form that image even further away from the retina. And so we'd actually have the opposite prescription in this case. And so now we'd put a diverging lens in there as well. Uh, or instead, I should say. And now the light rays, instead of coming in straight, are gonna have diverged just a little bit first and that way they won't converge until a little longer distance hopefully at the retina. And so that's kind of the idea. So for myopia, we want to recommend a diverging lens. So, and for hyperopia, a converging lens uh, to correct the issue. All right, one last thing. So uh, obviously you could have uh, some issues with your eye and maybe uh, you're old like me and, and your lens is no longer as flexible as it used to be. Uh, and so you can't focus on near things and, and you need the, uh, the first corrective issue we talked about with hyperopia. Uh, that could be an issue. Uh, but there's some other reasons where, where maybe lenses may not be able to form a nice clear image. And there's two of them we just want to briefly talk about. And it's spherical aberration as well as chromatic aberration. And you just need to know the definitions. So for spherical aberration, it turns out for a spherical lens, all the equations we're using here are kind of derived as approximations. And as long as the light rays are fairly close to the principal axis, they work well. But the further they get away from the principal axis, it turns out the focal distances are a little bit different for light rays that are further away. And as a result, the light rays that are further from that principal axis are gonna converge on a slightly different point from the ones that are closer. And since all the light rays don't converge on a single point, you don't form a nice, clear, crisp image 
as a result of this spherical aberration. The other one's called chromatic aberration, and it's related to a topic we've already talked about called dispersion. If you recall, dispersion uh, was the fact that uh, lights of different wavelengths have slightly different indices of refraction. So, and as a result, if you shine white light through a lens, so the refraction that's gonna take place is gonna be a little teeny bit different for different colors, different wavelengths of light. And so what you're gonna find is that the different colors when you shine white light through, form images at slightly different locations. And so instead of forming a nice, crisp, single image, the different colors actually formed at slightly different locations, again, giving you a blurry image. And again, that's chromatic aberration. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.